So welcome to Biggie. I have to tell you I'm really excited about this case because I'm really, really excited to talk about Disneyland, which as you know, is an incredibly important case. But before we do that, I want to make sure that we get started on time because I want to make sure that we get Leo to do his 90 push-ups as usual. Leo? So today we're going to talk about Disneyland and I wanted to ask Luca, I saw you in the Harvest talking about how fantastic Italy was. And so I'm guessing that you want to be cold called. So let me ask you, Luca, do you, have you ever been to Disneyland? Uh, Disneyland in the EU? No, no, no. How can Disneyland ever be in the EU? Well, Luca, I'm glad that you feel so passionately about the subject, but let me ask you, can you be a little bit more specific about what some of Disneyland's problems are? Disneyland is here, Europe is here. Disneyland's not even in Europe. How can it be in, in, in the EU? Turkey's not in the EU, okay, no? Okay, okay, okay. So I'm gonna stop you right there. I actually want to hold off on the solutions for now and talk about what are the other EU nations going to think about this. Yeah, Berta. Yeah, so I think that uh, actually it would be a good thing if uh, Disneyland joined the EU because the, the happiness level will definitely go up. That's not true. That's not true. So, Berta, I'm sure you've seen the popularity ratings in The Economist. If you see the graph, it's concave and not convex. And I think if we let Disneyland into the EU, the popularity would just go down. Okay, okay. I want to take this conversation offline and focus on the really important question of what can Disneyland do to gain entry into the EU? Yeah, Sasha. Yeah, so I actually had, uh, I mean, I had another question. Uh, what, is, uh, what is Disneyland trying to do here? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, so who can help Sasha out? Yeah, Barat. Uh, well, I, I, I'm no expert on uh, international relations because I, I worked in nonprofit, but I mean, I think they're trying to join the EU. Right. Okay, that's a great point. But now I really want to focus on the solutions. Yeah, Winston. Uh, I think that the Disneyland should put collars around their ticket prices so that the average person can still go. Okay, great. So that gets us to the really exciting question in the assignment. So, Winston, can you run us through the numbers? Uh, numbers? Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so apparently it was a late night for you guys. So I'm not going to cold call anybody. Okay, Jonathan, you have an answer for us? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an easy I'm the, Yeah, the answer is really simple. I, I, I think it's, you know, the college should be set at 65. That's pretty easy stuff. But, but I mean, leadership in situations like this, we just pull out the whips and the chains, the handcuffs, you know, stuff like that. It's really not that big of a deal. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's nice outside today. It's not that big of a deal. I don't, I don't think we really need to worry about it. At least in leadership, I wouldn't worry about it. It should be okay. Okay, so we have our first solution to this really important question. Okay, Jor, you want to get in on this? Yeah, I, I agree. That's actually an interesting case of real politic. And if we refer back to Putin, yeah. Uh, let me see here. Um, I, I, you know, I was talking to Tom about this earlier, and I think he had the answer. So what do we do about this? Okay, Andrew. 
Yeah, so I mean, I mean I'm looking at this and I, I've noticed that a lot of the population is uh, under 13. So I, I just don't understand. I, I really think we should just take all these kids, put them to work. Like I think it'll be great for the economy and you know, we'll get them off the streets where who knows what they're doing right now. Okay, so I said I wouldn't do this, but I think this one actually deserves a cold call from Jessica because she's worked in NGOs on this very issue before. Jessica? That just made me throw up a little bit in my mouth. That's awful. Andrew, I can't believe you would say that about those poor little children. I mean, that violates everything that has to do with human rights, and it's against the UN Charter, too. So, child labor is probably a bad thing, Andrew. So, putting aside the child labor issues for a second, what about the race issues that they've been having? The tension is building up in the country. What should they do about their BEE credits? Yeah, Michael. I'm sorry, I think I'd be calling her. I, you know, I, I think the problem is the B, 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 E, E, E credits here. I think if we uh, went and got some Indian labor, uh, we could get around the race issue that way. That's not quite what B, E, E was trying to accomplish. Okay, so going back to the solutions, what other things can they do? Arvind? Yeah, so I don't think I've told you guys this before, but uh, I was a VC before I came out to business school, and we actually looked at buying Disneyland with my company, and uh, unfortunately when we looked at it, the only way we could make money off it is if we sell it to an Iranian holding company uh, in the Middle East, and they were going to probably just destroy it. Uh, yeah. Okay, Matt. <laughs> Uh, I'm being told, I mean, from my experience as, uh, you know, being in charge of uh, weapons freeze uh, status on a carrier and a battle group uh, stationed right near Disneyland, actually, is, you know, the United States would protect Disneyland at all costs, Arvind. Yeah, so I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear that. Okay, yeah, Shiva. I think that takes Disneyland too far towards giving up sovereignty to the U.S. Hobbesian Leviathan. Okay, excellent. So, the case also mentions this really interesting thing that Disneyland is trying to do. So what would happen if they dropped prices and allowed visas for more people, especially the more unfortunate people, to visit Disneyland? This is the global leader class, so I want to think about how this fits in with strategy. So. Doesn't this give Disneyland a unique competitive advantage? Yeah, Scott. The lower the price, the, the more competitive your position. I mean, once we get down to zero, I mean, nobody will be able to compete with us. I mean, like, who, who can compete with free? Okay, Scott, excellent. Okay, so now, this is a really, really interesting point. So I want to just pose a question. What kind of world would it look like if you're providing all these incentives? Visas and fares and people are getting into these countries for free. Yeah, Phil. Well, to answer your question, Professor Duggan, I mean, this sounds like it would be a whole new world. So, obviously, we can't solve this problem in five minutes. And if we could, I promise you would win the Nobel Prize. But since this is the global leader, I'm going to defer to Professor Rivkin, who's going to introduce his guests. So, since Professor Rivkin is busy, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest. Let me introduce the Prime Minister of Disneyland, Mr. Bob Iger. Uh, uh, it looks like we have a question coming in. And I'm from Section D. HBS douchebags! Woo! Yeah! Woo! Yeah! Woo! Yeah! I'm glad I sat in on this section and not with those guys. Thank you for your perspective. It's really great to have you in class. And let me just conclude by reminding the class that you can change the way that the Disneyland government thinks about policy. As individuals, as firms, as citizens, you can actually affect things. You can actually change the world. And I would tell you how, but I've already kept you two minutes over. So with that, have a great summer. Thanks.